Hello, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Gabe Gunning, and I have the privilege of being your host this evening as we venture to a place known for its sun on a day that has been all about the sun. We are going to Spain. Now, when I found out just six days ago that we were going to have to do a different show on short notice, I asked myself, what is a place that I can basically talk about in my sleep? And an easy answer was Spain. And the next question was, I don't really feel like doing it by myself. Who is somebody that has the Spain travel experience, the enthusiasm and the can-do attitude um, to be a team player and join at the last minute? And that answer was also very easy because in a company of a lot of people with can-do attitudes, I'm not sure anybody has more of a can-do attitude than Robin Stencil. Robin, welcome back to Monday Night Travel. You joined us for Monday Night Travel about a year ago, I think last May, to discuss some of Europe's wow moments. And then you joined us in January for the Festival of Europe to chat about Switzerland and the Germanic world. Um, can you tell us what you've been up to recently and why you are particularly passionate about Spain? Sure. Thanks, Gabe. It's great to be back. A very nice introduction from you. That's very kind. Um, just like you, this is such an easy topic for me to talk about. While you might be used to seeing me pour my heart out about Germanic countries like Switzerland, I've actually spent more time in Spain than anywhere else in Europe. Um, so a lot of this is just kind of me living my life or kind of having a virtual road trip that I'm sharing with everyone. Some of my favorite places just from being on the ground so much in Spain. And speaking of being on road trips and on the ground in places, I should point out that we've kind of switched, roles have been reversed. Our, our guest is in the Monday Night Travel studio and I'm actually on the road um, visiting some friends in North Carolina. So everybody in North Carolina, Hello, um, I'm on your coast. Um, but uh, exactly, Robin said to me as we were preparing for this a few days ago, this is just gonna be like a road trip. It's kind of an impromptu, your friend calls you up and says, hey, you wanna, you wanna go on a road trip on short notice? So um, tonight we are gonna just keep it fun and casual and we are excited to take you around Spain with us. And we titled tonight's presentation, Beyond the Best of Spain. And I want to briefly explain why before we get started. So we have um, in our tour, our catalog of tour itineraries, we have one that is called The Best of Spain. It goes to Barcelona, then to Madrid with a couple iconic Madrid side trips. And then it goes down to Andalusia to visit the big metropolises of Sevilla and Granada and a couple hilltop towns. And this is kind of our recommendation of must sees for the majority of travelers that are going to Spain for the first time. But Robin and I are both of the belief that while this is a great itinerary for first timers, there are enough great destinations in Spain to fill multiple itineraries. And we wanted to highlight tonight some maybe lesser visited stops that would be great for a second or third trip to Spain, or if you're taking an extra long trip to Spain to add on to kind of this itinerary. So tonight we are really not gonna be covering any destinations in our tour itineraries. We see here the My Way Spain, we see we do best of Barcelona and Madrid, we have a best of Andalusia, and we have a Basque country tour. And of all those cities, the only one that we're going to, to tonight is Ubeda. So we are going to um, places that kind of go beyond our tour itinerary. Many of them are covered in our guidebook though. So if any of the places we discussed tonight look interesting to you, they're most likely in our guidebook if you wanted to research them more and consider a visit. So um, for our little road trip, this is the route that we're gonna take tonight. We are going to start where many travelers to Spain end. My parents are actually getting ready to do the Camino de Santiago, which ends in Galicia. And that is where we're going to start tonight um, in the northwestern corner of Spain. We're going to then work our way to wine country, to some mid-sized cities in the middle of Spain, down to some lesser known hill towns in Andalusia. And we're going to finish with a little side trip to Morocco. 
Are you feeling ready to go, Robin? I am ready, Gabe. I've got my wine. I've got oh. my cheese. I, this is going to be a great evening. Olé. Well, Robin is going to be talking about some tasty food uh, later on. So that is something to look forward to. But for now, we are going to start in the provinces of Galicia and Asturias. Um, I like to call these Spain's Atlantic Northwest. Robin and I live in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and so the northwestern corner of Spain borders the Atlantic Ocean and then the Bay of Biscay or Biscay to the north. Um, and uh, I don't, I've never heard anybody actually use the term Atlantic Northwest in Spain. So I put it in quotes. I think it's a uh, Gabe Gunnick original trademark. Um, so don't necessarily say that when you're in Spain, but that's how I think of this region, because as we'll explore, it also has a lot of similarities to the Pacific Northwest of the United States, especially in term of it, terms of its climate and geography. And the first place that we are going to go is to Santiago de Compostela. Um, so we are going to have Rick take us on a little trip to Santiago de Compostela now. The final leg of the journey leads through lush and green Galicia. And the gateway to Galicia is the rustic hamlet of Othe Braille, perched high on a ridge. The town welcomes pilgrims with ancient and characteristic stone huts. The church, founded in the 9th century, is one of the oldest on the Camino route. Pilgrims are sure to stop in for another stamp on their Camino credential. Green and densely forested Galicia shatters visitors' preconceptions of Spain. Pilgrims pass ghostly castles, simple farmhouses with slate roofs, and sleepy medieval villages. Here it's easy to see the Celtic heritage Galicians share with their cousins just across the sea in Ireland. After over a month on the trail, spirits are high as well-worn pilgrims reach their final stop, the city of Santiago de Compostela. Santiago has long had a powerful and mysterious draw on travelers. This neat and sturdy city is built of granite. Its arcaded streets are a reminder that winters here are cold and wet. Strolling across its squares and under its grand churches, you can imagine a time when the city was a religious and cultural powerhouse. Santiago's heyday was the 12th century, when the notion of Europe was still in its infancy. It was a place where people from all corners came together, shared ideas, and then dispersed. In some ways, the very idea of Europe as a civilization gelled during this age, and Santiago played an important role. Apart from all the pilgrim action and its venerable architecture, Santiago is a workaday town. Its vibrant market offers a fine opportunity to sample the essentials of its hearty cuisine. Farmers sell their produce. The shapely cheeses are enjoyed by locals and visitors alike. And the seafood is fresh as can be. A Galician specialty is octopus, prepared local style, or a la galega. After the tenderized octopus is boiled in a copper pot, it's snipped into bite-sized pieces. It's topped with a mix of sweet and spicy paprika, sea salt, and olive oil, then served on a wooden plate. Eat it with toothpicks, never a fork. People here have their own distinct language, Galego. It's a mix of Spanish and Portuguese. Galicia's ancient Celtic roots are particularly evident in its music. With wailing pipes and thundering drums, the Celtic heritage announces itself loud and clear. But nothing can distract the pilgrims as they take the final steps of their long journey. Around the last corner, they reach the destination of a thousand years of pilgrims, the cathedral that holds the tomb of St. James. As millions of weary yet exhilarated pilgrims have done before them, they stand before the cathedral and are filled with jubilation. But the religious climax for many lies within the cathedral. Imagine you're a medieval pilgrim. You've just walked 500 miles. Your journey is done. Worshiping before the altar, you give thanks to St. James for a safe passage and you reflect on the lessons of your journey. 
And if you're here on a festival day, the mass culminates with an enormous swinging incense burner. Gazing at the spectacle of this 120-pound burner flying through the air, you're awestruck by the wonder of God. Finally, you climb the stony staircase behind the altar to the statue of St. James, studded with precious gems. Embracing him from behind, you take a moment to celebrate your spiritual or personal triumph. So, Robin, I was fortunate that I got to actually be in Santiago de Compostela on Easter and I got to see that sensor swinging through the giant nave of the cathedral. And it was, I was amongst just all of the, the backpackers and the, uh, I mean, smell of them, but the joy of them um, was really remarkable. Um, and I think the thing that strikes me about Santiago de Compostela, we actually didn't talk about this. Have you been there? I haven't been to Santiago. I've just been to the very beginning of the of the Camino, um, where it actually crosses over from France into Spain. Oh, very, so we've been on opposite ends of the Camino then. Mm -hmm. um, it struck, the thing that I remember about being there is even though it was Easter and it was a festival day, I don't know what it is, if it's something about the rock that the city is made out of, but the city just feels really quiet, like almost kind of muffled. Um, and it is very like peaceful and serene, but that was definitely the feeling that, that I was left with. Um, Excellent. and yeah, it definitely is, has been a, a corner of Spain that pilgrims have gone to for, for centuries. Um, do you have any aspirations to walk the Camino someday, Robin? Uh, you know, I never say no to anything. I like the approach a lot of Spaniards and a lot of people in general do this is they'll do like a, one stretch at a time or like a hundred miles at a time or a week at a time or whatever they can afford to do within their own vacation. And I kind of like the idea of doing that kind of a journey. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's pretty cool to follow those clamshells all the way. And I think that's a good point. We've actually done a separate show on the Camino before um, with Cassandra Overby, who specializes in uh, walks throughout Europe. And she had a great point that a lot of people, when they think of the Camino, they think of the, the French way, the Ruta Francesa, which is the most popular one. But people in the Middle Ages would just walk to Santiago from wherever they were. So there's a lot of different paths. There's a Portuguese way. There's an English way that is only actually takes about 10 days. And so it's not an all or nothing. Um, when I studied abroad, I just did a one day hike along the Camino and then took the train back at the end of the day. And so um, even if you just want to get in a nice day of hiking and following shells, um, that's also an option. Um, at this point, I actually mentioning my study abroad, I want to go to a region that actually isn't on our tours, isn't in our guidebooks, is not on most travelers radar, uh, but where I studied in Spain, and that is the province of Asturias. Um, so if you were only going to remember one thing about Spanish history, of course, Spain has had a long history with so many interesting things, their connections to the New World, the Spanish Inquisition, the Civil War, but I would argue, and I'm happy to, to be wrong, but if, if there is one thing that has most affected Spain culturally um, in a way that you would feel just walking around different cities in Spain, um, that has most just affected kind of the feel of the place, it is the invasion of the Moors um, that came up from Africa in the year 711 AD, one of the few dates that I remember from history. And in a a little over a decade, they took over the majority of the Iberian Peninsula and created a kingdom that they called Al-Andalus, Al which is still what we get Andalusia from today. And if you look, that top little bit on the western edge, that is Asturias. So famously, Asturias has a lot of pride because they are the ones that stopped this insurgence of the Moors from Africa um, 
and began something called the reconquest, the reconquista. So gradually taking Spain back from the Moors and back into the Christian control. And so you're going to see the further south places are in Spain, the longer the Moors were there and the more palpable that Moorish um, character is, the more of that Arab architecture you're going to see. Whereas in Asturias, as we'll talk about in a moment, you don't see any of it because the Moors were never there. So it all started with this gentleman, Don Pelayo. So Don Pelayo or Pelagius, I think it is in English. Um, he was kind of the king of Asturias. Um, the Moors had suffered a defeat in Toulouse in the south of France. They were coming home in 722, 11 years after coming into the Iberian Peninsula. And they figured there had been all these little uprisings and skirmishes in Asturias. They figured it'd be good for morale after a loss to just quell these uprising in Asturias before coming home. And Don Pelayo and his troops, even though they were outnumbered, they retreated into the mountains um, and they were able to use the geography to their advantage and to defeat those advancing Moorish troops. You can see behind Don Pelayo's statue, this cross, La Cruz de la Victoria, the cross of victory. It was said that he uh, carried a wooden cross that looked like this, and it has now become the symbol of Asturias. You can see this is the Asturian flag. It has the alpha and omega, um, and they like to say that Asturias has never been conquered. They then built way up in the mountains in this little, I guess, village um, called Covadonga. It only has like 58 actual inhabitants, but it is kind of this sacred site in Asturias because it's where this battle happened that started the reconquest. They built this Basilica de Santa Maria la Real de Covadonga, and it is striking. It just kind of trumpets up from the ground and it's made from this reddish stone that really pops amidst the green mountains. It's actually located in a national park called Picos de Europa, the peaks of Europe in the north of Spain. And it is just surrounded by mountains. We had to take a very long zigzaggy bus ride to get here. Another incredible site of Covadonga is where um, Don Pelayo is interred, and that is in the Santa Cueva de Covadonga, the sacred cave of Covadonga. And it has this little chapel um, where Don Pelayo was buried, and it is over this beautiful waterfall. Um, it is really a sight to behold. Also, for anybody that's a hiker, again, this is in the Picos de Europa National Park. You can see that in the small text on these signs. So it's a great place for anybody interested in both a little bit of culture and history along with their outdoor pursuits. I mentioned the Cruz de Victoria, and it is now housed in the capital of Asturias called Oviedo. This is where I spent five months studying Spanish while I was in college. And it is said, the legend is that the son of Don Pelayo um, kept his wooden cross and then eventually, a couple um, decades later, they decided to have it kind of encrusted in, uh, kind of covered in gold and encrusted in all of these gems. Carbon dating has said that this was not the original cross that Don Pelayo carried, almost certainly, um, but is still an homage to that victory. And it is housed in the Catedral de Oviedo, which we see here. Oviedo is kind of the cultural hub of Asturias here. This was just on one of my visits. I don't actually know what this um, kind of cultural meeting was, but you see people in this traditional dress. You can see a bagpiper there. I'm a runner. And actually, while I was running once in Oviedo, I just like happened upon a bagpipe concert. Um, so it really is true that you see a lot of bagpipes, or as they say, gaitas in this part of Spain. It also has more modern culture. This is the Teatro Campo Amor, the theater. I saw a Spanish opera, a Sarsuela show there. It's also known for its many sculptures, Oviedo. In fact, usually when my friends and I were meeting up, we would base it off of which sculpture. Most frequently, we stayed at the one on the right, which is just called La Gorda, which kind of the, um, it is, it's a Madonna and Child by Botero. Um, who actually died recently, a South American artist known for these rotund figures. 
Um, but La Gorda just translates to kind of the chubby one. <laughs> and so um, that is where we would most often meet uh, before going out for the evening. Speaking of going out, Oviedo is known for the Calle Gascona, which is known as El Boulevard de la Sidra, the Boulevard of Cider. Their most famous drink there is this kind of uh, alcoholic apple cider, but the way that it's produced, it's a little bit flat and viscous. So when you pour it, this is my friend doing not a very good job. You're supposed to pour it at a height so that it kind of hits the glass and froths up. They have waiters on the boulevard of the cider that will do this correctly, where they hold the bottle as far above their head as they can, and they hold the glass as far down as they can and pour in a tiny stream that goes right in front of their face. And they pour you just about an inch, and you're supposed to drink it all at once before it goes flat again. And then the waiters just kind of go around to the next table, and you wait for them to come back again. Um, it's a very great social drink, low alcohol content, cheap. Um, good pre-gaming before a night out if you're a college student. Um, culinarily, the most iconic dish in Asturias is babada asturiana. It is a stew that is made with um, chorizo, sausage, and fava beans. And my Spanish mama always lamented the fact that I was a vegetarian and that she couldn't prepare it for me. <laughs> Last, kind of the last thing that I would say Oviedo is famous for is it has three different kind of UNESCO heritage sites that are these pre-Romanesque temples and shrines. So this one, Santa Maria del Naranco, was initially built as kind of a royal summer residence. Um, it's just two floors. It was built in um, the 840s. Um, and later, a few centuries later, also became a um, kind of a, a church. And you can see here, this is kind of the interior, very ornately decorated. Um, and actually this, I realized just as I was researching for this, that um, these arches are actually used in the Astu Tourism Board of Asturias's logo is these same arches and it says Asturias Paraíso Natural, natural paradise. So that's kind of how they brand themselves as yes, they have culture, but they have beautiful nature um, that is different from the rest of Spain. Nearby, there is the temple that would have been used um, by the royals, um, San Miguel de Lillo and you are able to enter those. And then Naranco is actually the name of this mountain right next to Oviedo. Oviedo is at the foot of it. And at the very top is the El Cristo, the Christ statue. And it just kind of presides over the city. And it's a nice way, if you're new to the city, to orient yourself of always being able to look for where is the Cristo. He's always looking down um, from up above the hill. And of course, below him is the Cross of Victory, La Cruz de la Victoria. There is Oviedo from the hill. And I wanna finish up with just a very quick visit. Um, Asturias has a lot of beautiful little kind of former fishing towns that are small and cute and have beaches. Two of them are Candas and Luanco. Um, here is just a little view of Candas. It is just workaday, but has its charms and it has a beautiful secluded beach. I really wanna go back in the summer sometime when I can fully enjoy this beach, though I did go in this day, even though it was March and rainy. Um, and there was a kind of consortium of these coastal counties that banded together to build some trails that connect some of the towns. So you can walk between Candas and Luanco. I think it was about three miles. We ended up taking a wrong turn and ended up on the road at one point. So here is my classmates quickly running um, to get off the road. And we ended up in Luanco, which again, nothing groundbreaking, but just cute clock tower, cute little chapel, cute streets. Um, and again, here is me in front of another beautiful beach. So I do wanna point out if you Oftentimes for people kind of doing the best of Spain that gets them down to Andalusia, we really recommend traveling in shoulder season with how hot that region gets. But I wanna point out, um, these are average temperatures here. So I averaged the high and low. So actually the high for the day is gonna be even higher than these numbers that you see here. But you can see that if we're in Sevilla, 
it is going to be in the summer, it's going to be an average of mid eighties, um, which means a high of about, you know, in the nineties every day. Whereas even in the middle of the summer, you're probably going to get a high in the mid seventies and an average temperature in the mid sixties. If you're in the North, like in Santiago or Bilbao or Asturias. So it makes a great place to go. If you want to be out on the beach, um, or exploring nature and not frying. So that is our little tour of the Atlantic Northwest. And now that we've had a taste of some of the nature and culture up there, we're going to get a taste of some fine Spanish wine in the Rioja. And uh, I think, Robin, that you have a wine to share with us now. I do, Gabe. And I was going to say about um, the northern part of Spain, that is where most of the Spanish people will go on holiday in the summer to just avoid the heat. It was one of my first road trips in the summer, and I remember it just being beautiful and magical and not too hot at all, as opposed to Sevilla, which was over 100 degrees, 10 days in a row. I'm done with being in Sevilla in August, so I agree with you. Um, the other great thing about Galicia is its wine. Uh, and we're going to talk about Rioja wine in a minute, but this is the wine that I'm drinking tonight. It's an Albariño from um, Galicia in, in Reyes Baixas. I'm not as up in my Spanish pronunciations <laughs> as you, but um, a really great thing to drink a cold, crisp white wine when you're up there having all of um, the beautiful scenery and food as well. Uh, but we're going to go on to Rioja, which I would say is sort of the equivalent of the Tuscany of Spain. Um, so Rioja is really best known for its red wine, which is Tempranillo. I'm sure that you've heard of those grapes, that varietal before. Um, and what they also have is a special white wine there. Uh, a lot of people just think of the Tempranillo red wine. You can actually have a white Tempranillo, which is made with the same grapes, but produced in a white wine style. But if you're really adventurous, um, you ought to try the white Rioja there. It's made of a mix of a local white varietal grape that's typically blended with like a Sauvignon Blanc, or a Verdejo, which are both really nice white wines that we're used to uh, in the U.S. as well. One thing that they do really well here is wine tourism, and you have an amazing chance to go out and see the local vineyards. You can also go out to some of the beautifully architectural uh, wineries in the area. Two of the most famous, well-known, recognizable ones are the Riscal, which was built by Gary, and the Ios, which is uh, looks like an organ or an ocean. It's been compared to a couple of different things there. Um, so just like in the United States, in the Pacific Northwest, we have the Walla Walla and Columbia Valley. Um, in Spain and in California, we have Napa and Sonoma and whatnot. In Spain, if you are serious about going and having some wine tasting, I would recommend going up to the Rioja region. There are two main towns here, Otañón and Logroño. And in either of these towns, either of these towns, um, you have the opportunity again to visit some of the smaller kind of craft um, wineries, boutiques, or you can also find spectacular wine in any bar, in any little taverna. You will get the most spectacular bottle or glass of wine to go along with your dinner that is locally made, totally unique. This one particular bottle, Gabe, is my great white whale of a wine. <laughs> I have been looking ever since the very first time I went to Spain. I had this bottle of wine at a dinner. It was better than any wine I'd ever had. I look for it every time I go back to Spain in every grocery store, in every wine bodega, and I can't find it anywhere, but I have the photo of it. So it'll live on in my memory forever. Was it actually a white wine, Robin? No, it was a red wine. Oh, it was so it's your great Leo. red whale. Yeah, it's a great, you're right. It's a great <laughs> red whale. Oh, I wish I could find it again, maybe someday. Um, but with that in mind, there are a lot of differences between the American way of drinking wine and the Spanish way of drinking wine. This is another great ex um, example of wine tourism, where you can go and actually stay at a hotel that's connected with a winery. This one happens to be in another wine region called Ribera de Duero. Well, those two, I would say, are the best known for red wines in Spain, Rioja and Ribera de Duero. Um, fantastic wines. And some tips 
that any person going to Spain drinking wine needs to know, especially if you're used to the classification way of how we talk about wine in the United States. Um, this is another special bottle of white wine from Rioja. They actually made this white wine to accompany a like Michelin star sushi restaurant. So I brought a bottle back and had some not quite Michelin star level sushi, but some really good Seattle sushi. And I tell you what, it was perfect to go with the sushi. So don't be afraid of drinking white wine, um, real ha with sushi. But what I wanted to point out is that um, even though I know you can't really see this label too well, and it's in, you know, Japanese writing, um, on any bottle of wine that you pick up in Spain, you're not as likely to find the name of the grape. Like in America, we kind of call, we have the grape on the bottle. So you'll, you'll say, oh, I want a Merlot, or I want a Cabernet Sauvignon, or I want a Chardonnay. But in Spain, you have to know what region that you want in order to know if it's the grape that you want. So you have to know that in Rioja, it's Tempranillo. So if you want a Tempranillo, you can't look on the bottle for the word Tempranillo. You have to look on the bottle for the word Rioja, which you can't even see on here. You can see just how tiny it says Rioja right there. So you really have to know your stuff and know what region comes with which variety of grape in order to find the perfect bottle of wine. And Robin, like I'm, I'm not, I enjoy wine. I don't know much about it. How much could somebody expect to spend on kind of an average bottle of wine in the Rioja? Is it, is it cheaper because you're drinking it where it's produced or? Uh, Gabe, I'm going to blow your mind and I'm going to blow anyone's mind who's watching, who's used to U.S. glass or bottle prices of wine. Uh, a good, like premium glass of wine at a bodega or at a restaurant is not going to be any more than six or seven euros. Oh, really? And yeah. And like in the grocery store, a bottle of wine probably isn't going to be more than like 30 or 40 euros unless you're going really, really, really high end. And then they can get up to like 100, 150, which still is not that much compared to U.S. pricing. But I would say at any taberna or bodega or restaurant, you can ask even just for the house wine and it will probably be like maybe with inflation, like three or four euros for a glass, but it's going to be better than any table wine that you would ever find in the U.S. Well, that is, I mean, I, I do like Spanish prices. Um, it, it is a nice part of traveling in Spain. And Robin, you shared um, your one of your favorite wines with us. How can... Um, is there any way that people in the U.S. can find good Rioja wines if outside of the Rioja, if they want to get a taste before they go? Definitely. There are some big name brands that export to the United States. And really, just remember, you're looking for Rioja and you're looking, if it's a Tempranillo, the chances of it being from Rioja are pretty high. Um, so going into your local, even Trader Joe's, I think, has a pretty decent like Tempranillo um, they, they do. It's it's a screw top and it's not bad for what you're getting. So um, you can definitely find it. And then again, like some some of the higher end, well-known Spanish like, like Spanish wines like Vega Cecilia, um, you can find collectors will have it, but it's pretty expensive. All right. Well, Robin, thank you for that taste of the Rioja. I know that you're also going to have some great food for us to pair with our wine later. I hope you enjoy yours. Um, I'm going to keep working on trying to seeing, maybe I can go back to the Cristo and see if he can turn my water into some wine for me. <laughs> um, but in the meantime, we are going to continue on. And the next place that we are going to go is we're going to go from kind of the rural to a little bit more urban. We are going to look at some mid-sized cities of Castilla y Leon. Castilla y Leon, if we went back to the map, it's a big province that's kind of in the center north of Spain. I kind of think of Castilla y Leon as like average Spain. You get a lot of these communities in the north that are very niche, like the Catalan people and the Basque people, many of whom have their own language. And then in the south, you get that very heavy Moorish influence. And kind of in the middle of it all, you have Castilla y Leon. Um, in fact, the version of Spanish that people speak in Spain is called Castellano from Castilla. 
Um, so it kind of just feels like it is kind of quintessential Spain. Um, so we're going to actually start out by exploring Burgos, and we are going to have Rick take us there, and then I'm going to share some of my photos. But first, here we go to Burgos. <laughs> It's a pedestrian-friendly city straddling its river. Stately plane trees line the riverside promenade, giving shade through the hot days. Its main square seems designed to bring the community together. Today's Burgos feels workaday, but with a hint of gentility and former power. Like so many towns here in the north of Spain, it became important during the Reconquista, that centuries-long struggle to push the Muslim Moors back into northern Africa from where they came. Its position on the community Santiago and as a trading center helped it to flourish. For five centuries, Burgos was the capital of the Kingdom of Castile. It's dominated by an awe-inspiring Gothic cathedral designed by French architects in the 13th century, with its lacy spires added by German architects in the 14th. The ornate exterior is matched by its lavish and brightly lit interior. In Spain, the final flowering of the Gothic age was the elaborate plateresque style. As was typical of Gothic churches, it's ringed by richly decorated chapels built over the centuries by and for wealthy parishioners. This chapel is dedicated to Saint Anne, the Virgin Mary's mother. Its 15th century altar features the Tree of Jesse. A sleepy and apparently very fertile Jesse slumbers at the bottom, sprouting a lineage that connects him to the Holy Child and Virgin. This sumptuous chapel marks the tomb of a regional governor and his wife under a brilliant star-shaped vault. It's striking for its gracefulness and femininity. Now, I um, had the, the privilege of getting to go to Burgos um, the year I studied in Spain, actually the year after I studied in York, England. And it was so wonderful to visit another mid-sized, former like medieval power walled city. It almost kind of felt like a Spanish York to me. Um, and it just I just felt at home there immediately. Again, my classmates and I were more there in the winter to early spring, so we didn't have all the flowers on these plain trees coming out, but it was it just, it was one of those just really potent feelings of being transported to a new place, walking down this promenade with all of these nobbled trees, approaching through these nobbled trees, seeing two great sights, seeing the front gate to the city and seeing um, the rose window of the Gothic cathedral. Um, we have the Arco de Santa Maria was one of the 12 main gates of the original walls of the city. Um, and on it are a bunch of notable figures from um, the history of Burgos. One of them, there's also a statue here, is El Cid. The El Cid. Um, he was a kind of famous knight that both fought like against the Christians and the Muslims at different points, but really epitomized kind of this medieval knight. And the most famous Spanish poem of the Middle Ages was written about El Cid. And so he's a very famous figure. He was born in a village just on the outskirts of Burgos. Um, then we have the beautiful Gothic cathedral, which just Sometimes you see these cathedrals that just kind of erupt directly upwards, but this one, it just feels like there's all these levels to it. Um, and as Rick said, inside you see these uh, kind of beautiful um, vaulted ceilings with all this intricate stonework. Another mid-sized city in Castilla y Leon that I want to point out is Leon itself. Um, it also has a very noteworthy Gothic cathedral with some of the best Gothic cathedral stained glass in Europe. You see all the pointed arches. Um, that's how we know it's a Gothic cathedral. Um, it's also known for, there's the San Isidro church, which this is not a great photo, but it has some very famous um, frescoes from the Romanesque period. We see all those rounded arches that indicate the Romanesque period. Um, it also has an early work of Gaudi. So we don't see Gaudi's kind of dripping facades, but we do see some of his 
flights of fancy with all of these turrets. Um, he was commissioned to uh, build this building, and there is now a museum in it, the Museo Casa Botines, about the construction. And lastly, um, there's the, they call it the MUSAC, the Museum of Contemporary Art, um, or Artes Contemporaneos. Um, and so I, I love, I almost feel like Rick talks a lot about second cities, and usually he is referring to really large, formerly industrial cities that are now becoming a bit more kind of cultured and chic, places like Hamburg and Liverpool. I almost feel like we need this category of like third cities. Cities, certainly Leon and Burgos had, um, you know, a lot of cultural importance back in the Middle Ages, but it's not like they became these massive cities during the industrial period. But now they're just kind of these mid-sized cities. I looked it up, um, the three mid-sized cities I'm talking about here, um, I will mention Salamanca in just a moment. They're all 125 to 175,000 people, the size of like between, that's the size of Topeka, Kansas to Salem, Oregon. Um, and I just think all of them, I think it's nice sometimes to visit these cities that do still have some great cultural offerings, but they're not gonna have the huge tourist crowds and you can almost feel like you're just a local spending time in the main square and it's something in between one of the massive cities and one of these tiny towns. And so I like incorporating some of those into my itineraries. The last one I said I would mention is Salamanca, which is famous for having the oldest university in Spain, and I believe one of the top five oldest in the world. Um, this is the bridge leading into Salamanca. It has um, a literary connection with another famous literary figure. So El Cid is a famous literary figure. And then there's this kind of young mayor do well named Lazario del Tormes. So it's the Tormes River that goes right by Salamanca. And there was this um, very popular series of picaresque um, little stories about all of this young boy's misadventures in, um, with a blind man um, that kind of travels along with him. Um, so if you're a literature nerd, it could be fun to read up some of um, some of the Lazaria del Tormes' stories and then visit Salamanca. It is also famous for the Casa de las Conchas. So this is the house of shells. We can see an old illustration of it and a modern photo to see that it has not changed much. And um, it is covered in the iconic shell symbol, which is a symbol of the city. So we're gonna finish our little stop to these mid-sized cities of um, Castilla y Leon by going to Salamanca with Rick. And he's gonna give us a little glance at especially the university culture there. A Roman bridge leads to the sunny sandstone city of Salamanca, Spain's premier university town. Salamanca is more youthful and less touristy than Toledo. Enjoy a paseo, that's Spain's traditional stroll, with the local crowd down Rua Mayor and into its famous main square. Plaza Mayor, built in 1729, is the ultimate Spanish plaza, a fine place to nurse a drink and watch the world go by. It's a stress-free, multi-generational mix that, to me, is quintessentially European. The handsome town hall overlooks the square. While most squares honor a king or saint, this one also commemorates commoners from the region. Plaques above the colonnade depict Castilian writers such as Cervantes, who wrote Don Quixote, heroes and conquistadors such as Cortes, popular saints like Teresa, kings, and even dictators. Here's Franco. On Sunday after Mass, old-timers gather here to shake their castanets.
A highlight of any visit to Salamanca is its famous university. The oldest in Spain, it was established in the early 1200s and was one of Europe's leading centers of learning for 400 years. Today, while no longer so prestigious, it's laden with history and especially popular with American students for its excellent summer program. The university's ornately decorated grand entrance is another example of Spain's fancy plateresque style. The people studying the facade aren't art fans. They're trying to find a tiny frog on a skull that students look to for good luck. Okay, up the column, take a left, find the skull, the frog's on top. Now forget him. Let's follow the facade's symbolic meaning. The bottom part thanks King Ferdinand and Queen Isabel for the money to make the building. The middle section celebrates Charles V with the coat of arms of his Habsburg Empire, the world's only superpower in the early 1500s. Finally, as a statement of the school's open-mindedness, the top honors the Pope while putting him in the company of pagan gods. This venerable arcade leads to lecture halls where Spain's brightest minds grappled with issues raised by the dawning of a new age. Imagine Golden Age heroes paging through these books and pondering these globes. Cortez came here for travel tips. The narrow wooden tables and benches, whittled down by centuries of studious doodling, are originals. Professors spoke boldly from the pulpit. It was here that the free-thinking monk Luis de Leon taught in the 1500s. He challenged the church's control of the word of God by translating part of the Bible from Latin into the people's language of Castilian. Because of this, he was tossed into jail for five years. When finally released, he returned to this pulpit and began his first lecture with, as we were saying, courageous men of truth, like Luis de Leon, believed the forces of the Inquisition were not even worth acknowledging. Traditionally, Salamanca's struggling students earned money to fund their education by singing in the streets. This centuries-old troubadour tradition survives today as musical combos called tuna bands dressed in distinctive outfits play lutes, guitars, and sing. For a fee, they serenade fancy family gatherings. And, celebrating with a beer after their gig's done, they can't resist brightening a bride-to-be's bachelorette party. And this fun ride to the band, the oldest in Salamanca, gave us a memorable trip finale back on the Plaza Mayor. Hmm. You know, Robin, I think all of Europe obviously does kind of plazas and these public meeting spaces, I think, better than we do in the U.S., but I think that Spain does them particularly well. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I do. And I, I think it's hilarious because if you hit those public squares just too early, it'll be like a ghost town. But if you come back after 7 or 8 p.m., you'll think, where did all these people come from? No, wait, Robin, are are you a morning person, though? I am a morning person. <laughs> See, Spain is great for me because I'm a night owl. So I'm like, yeah. oh, things don't start up until, you know, <laughs> nine, ten. And yeah. Nine. Great. How do you cope with that as a morning person? Well, I, I was going to say this is the biggest tip that I have about traveling to Spain is that you just have to set your internal clock and set the actual watch to Spanish time. And that means that you don't eat dinner until 10 o'clock. Nine o'clock would be too early. 10 o'clock is probably average time that I eat. And it's so funny because when I'm there, I just adapt to it. But then as soon as I come home the next day, it's seven o'clock and I'm starving. <laughs> well, I'm glad that your body has uh, adjusted <laughs> to Spanish rhythms. And we're going to now go even further south into, I think, where siesta culture and staying up late is most profound, which is down in the south of Spain. And you are going to take us, a lot of people are familiar with the hill towns of Andalusia. You're going to take us to maybe a couple hill towns that we haven't heard of before. Possibly, yeah. Um, and what I would say about that is one of the one of the favorite things that I love to do when I'm um, 
taking a, a road trip is actually not having a destination in mind. I mean, the destination is where I have to get to to sleep that night. But if I see an interesting little turnout, you know, I'm going to take it. And I think that's where a lot of this comes from. Um, so yeah, with that, I'm going to walk us through a couple of the Pueblos Blancos, the little white hill towns uh, of the Andalusia region, starting off with Sahara. And there are a couple here, they're in Rick's books, uh, specifically the ones that I'm talking about, these, these next couple ones, but you can see this kind of whitewashed hill town originally was there and they were they were kind of the last stand against the Moors, as you were mentioning before, Gabe. And um, these little enclaves of and villages where you really get off the beaten track, you really have to take the back roads, you really have to make an effort to get up there. And then once you get up there, you have this beautiful view, not only looking over the valley below and the and the lakes and the reservoirs that you have, but you get a, a real sense of how these communities were built up. And a, a lot of them, again, for defensive reasons, were built on top of hills, um, but they are time warped because of the, the way that they have been built and the way that they're, the landscape surrounds them, they really can't expand. So a lot of what you're seeing is original to what that culture really um, was established. We go on to the next town, and this is Grazalema, and another one you can barely even see the, the buildings and the houses nestled into the hillside, so you can see what a great defensive strategy that was. Uh, but this is a specific town. They are so known for their fiestas, and every little town in Spain has a fiesta, and if you're lucky enough to be there on fiesta day, now again, I couldn't really control what time I was there. So I unfortunately was there during a siesta, but you can see all of the flags. And even in the next photo, we see this grand patio just covered in flags. And um, what you don't see from this photo, what I, what I didn't include here is they actually have iron gates that close off either end of the town. And a lot of these little villages will have like, little miniature um, running with the bulls. I mean, nothing like Pamplona or whatnot, but they have the gates up, A, to keep people safe, and B, to kind of contain these fiestas. Um, but definitely a highlight is to be there. And I think what we're talking about, Gabe, what you and I have been talking about all night and what we'll continue to talk about is this is the difference between being a tourist and traveling in Spain and like living in Spain and what it can be like when you become a temporary local and when you really take the time to divert from your um, your itinerary or where those like big gems like Barcelona, Madrid, Sevilla, Toledo, Granada are going to be, um, slow down and experience life the way that people are still experiencing life in these little villages. Now, one and, of my favorite well, little discussions. Robin, yeah. before, before you go on, I think we do need to clarify between fiesta and siesta um, totally. for those that <laughs> aren't as familiar with Spanish. Um, I mentioned siesta. Can you tell us can you clarify siesta versus fiesta? Yeah, definitely. So siesta is is when people take time out of the middle of the day to traditionally it was when the workers would go home or especially if they were farmers, they would get out of the heat of the day, go home, go inside, have a home cooked meal, have a nap. That's where we get the siesta from. And then go back to work later in the evening when it had cooled down after they had digested it, after they'd spent time with their families. It's, it's less and less that you see this um, because of just the way that the world works now. But in a lot of big towns, you still have stores and shops that close in the middle of the day, mainly between like two and five. Um, a, on the other hand, a fiesta is a party. And so fiestas are festivals and they, are, they can be centered around a saint or a holiday or um, that town's like the naming of the town or the founding of the town. Um, they often are accompanied with lots of fireworks and quite a lot of beer. Thank you, Robin. You bet. Now, this next one is, um, well, actually, we're going to stop at the Pilata Cave first. This is something really spectacular. If you're driving through Andalusia, I highly, highly, highly recommend that you um, make a reservation in advance for the Pilata Cave. This is an ancient, prehistoric, 40,000-year-old cave. And when you enter, you get to go in and see prehistoric cave drawings. Now, there's only a couple places you're allowed to take photos, and this is one of them. But this is one of the original prehistoric cave drawings where you can take a photo. Um, it's 
phenomenal inside here and they have found like stalactites and stalagmites. This is incredible, Gabe. You couldn't take a picture of this. But uh, archaeologists have gone in and have studied the stalactite and the stalagmites and have found um, slivers of bone in the stalactite and in the stalagmite. And what they have uh, theorized is that it was the world's first instrument that that the cave dwellers would take bones and hit them against the, the stalactites and stalagmites, which are hollow, and they would make echoing noises for ceremonies, for working, for pleasure. This is what they are hypothesizing. Um, and it was like just absolutely spectacular to be in this um, in this location. The most important thing to know about this particular site is that there is no website. You have to call and make a reservation. And I asked them, I was there for research last year and I said, well, are you thinking about getting a website? And they say, we don't have reception up here. So there's no use of having a website. This is Spain, uh, like backdoor Spain at its core. You can always have um, someone help you out making that phone call though. Um, your ho hotel, your b and or just any local would be happy to help you make this reservation. And I love that, Robin, because um, those who watch Monday Night Travel a lot, we did a show back in the fall with uh, Larita and Lauren Porti, who do a show on road trips from the Washington, D.C. area. And they did one to Shenandoah and to the nearby Luray Caverns in Virginia. Yeah. And they have a stalag, stalactite, stalagmite pipe organ. So yeah. kind of continuing mm -hmm. this prehistoric tradition. Right. And now this next uh, hill town I love, it was, it's just a little hidden oasis, but I think I really like it because every time I see that name, it reminds me of my last name. <laughs> it looks like my last name. Um, but this town in particular, it, it there actually are road signs pointing you in the direction. And if you happen to be driving past, I encourage you to go there. It is known for their Tascas, which are little um, cave bodegas where you can uh, go in and have what uh, Spaniards call the Kenya, which is a little can of beer. So it, um, they're just kind of like smaller than what we would have, like a Budweiser can would be uh, smaller in ounces. And you can go in there and have your little Kenya at, with the locals. And this is um, something that is really unique. And so these these tascas, these bars are under these overhanging rocks. And I think in the next photo, you even see better um, the architecture of these, of the, the dwellings there. And there's really like, what's the point of going to this town? You have to go out of your way to, to get there even, but it's because it's so unique and it's not like anything else that you're going to see in the rest of the United States or in the rest of Spain. So it's really become popular with locals and with visitors to come see these famous tascas. And then my favorite hill town and what uh, Gabe was mentioning earlier, we do actually go to this um, this place on our Andalusia tour. It's called Ubeda. And it is known to be a, a Renaissance town. Uh, it's, it's architecturally, you can see that uh, it represents the Renaissance of Spain. And as we go on and we see different photos, you'll also notice that the walls here, again, were built during the time of the Moors. So it's a medieval walled city overlooking all of the olive groves. And Ubeda is in the middle of the Hayen region. And this is where 80 million olive trees exist amongst all of these Renaissance buildings. So um, the other thing that this is known for a couple of sites, if you are interested in visiting Ubeda, uh, you can go to the chapel. I think this is in the next photo game. Um, so yeah, the Chapel of El Salvador, which is actually a it's not really a church. It was more like a mausoleum. Um, and you can go in there and see how ornate it was uh, that this one of the most historic people of Ubeda had decided that he was going to build himself a chapel. Um, and uh, then the other really unique thing, because of how old Ubeda was, it's layers upon layers upon layers of history and culture. And this is the synagogue of the of the water that's on the other side of the screen. And um, what often happens in these very old towns is that as you start to rebuild and have construction, you often unearth things that were underneath the last version of the construction. So this was a building they were gonna build more modern apartments on and they had to do a little bit of digging to find out this, where the structure lied. And they uncovered an ancient um, bath, an ancient Jewish bath. 
And what's even more incredible, Gabe, is that probably before it was a, a Jewish bath, it was probably a pagan temple because you can barely see, but you see the light that's going into the well of the water on the solstice. There's a window and the light comes directly through the window onto the water during solstice. So that's how they think that maybe it was pagan. And more importantly, it's on ley lines, which you hear of like the Stonehenge being on a ley line, some of the um, other really mystical things around the world being on ley lines. Uh, this man here, Andrea, he will demonstrate with two wire hangers and he'll walk in a straight line with the wire hangers pointing directly ahead of him. And all of a sudden, as he walks, the wire hangers will cross from the magnetism mm -hmm. of the ley line. So this is a really special place and definitely worth going and visiting while you're in Ubuda. The other thing that Ubuda is known for is its craftsmanship from the um, what everything that they make out of rope. Um, so a lot of really beautiful things, not only as souvenirs, but really this is how they live. So they, this is what they had available to them as the material for making all of their daily life um, things. And now it's turned into like a modern day craft. Uh, and then gave the other thing that they have there that they're well known for is pottery. And there are a couple different families that are very, very well known in Ubuda. And often you can go in and see them at work and then walk through their display, of course, seeing the different um, stages of the pottery from being just molded to being fired. Um, it's spectacular. And then, of course, if you're if you want to, you can take a souvenir home. Uh, another edible souvenir that you can take home with you from Ubuda is, of course, olive oil. And like I was saying, 80 million olive oil trees here and uh, in high end just known for producing their olive oil. And if you're lucky enough to go during harvest time, you can actually walk through the groves. And what you'll see is the workers and the way that they harvest the olives from the trees now is you'll see on the next on the next photo, you'll see um, that they have these sticks and they used to just like shake the branches with the sticks and then they would put a tarp around the bottom of the tree and that's where all of the olives would would fall and then they'd gather them. But now, Gabe, they're a little bit more um, modern than that and they have sticks that you can see. They shake the branches with the sticks and all of the olives fall down into the net. And then from there, they go on and uh, harvested. The scene is from... Um, a farm that we visit. Let the video play out here so we can see it. You can imagine that during harvest time, which happens around, it, it's around November, depending on how the weather is. Um, every single tree is is just shaken like that. Uh, <laughs> it and really like kind saying, of breaks the like peaceful illusion of looking <laughs> out over the groves of olive it, trees. It does it in this particular um, farm uh, is. Uh, Spiritu Santo, and I think we'll see a photo next, um, that it's an ecolo bioecological farm. So you see donkeys roaming around. So they don't believe in pesticides. They just believe that like the nature will take care of itself. Um, and so for being such an ecological bio um, establishment to have like gas powered noise <laughs> shaking the trees. Uh, but a lot of places in Ubuda, around Ubuda, in Haiyan in general, you can go tour a facility and see how it's made. And I think, um, like I said, we were there during harvest and you get to taste the, like, you see that olive oil. It's a very different color than what we're used to, but this was like very virgin, young, first press of the whole year olive oil um, that we got to taste. And in in uh, Ubuda, there are two really well-known types of olive oil. There's the piqual and there's the arbicana. And I love the piqual. And normally I even like put the piqual olive oil over my cheese with a little bit of salt to make the all the flavors come out. It's amazing. But if you have time, Gabe, what I would highly recommend is going down the road to another olive oil um, facility called Castilla de Canena. And yeah, that was the that was the photo of him there. This is set in a honest to God castle, and that is the owner of the castle. And you walk into this castle, and he's just there, you know, giving you wine and, and giving you olive oil. And there's like a three course lunch that's just focused on the olive oil that this 
farm produces and you just think am i dreaming i'm this is a real life fairy tale to be in a castle tasting olive oil um you can't get that in a big city not authentically at least but i highly recommend doing that and then i can't talk about the hill towns without talking about the storks and you see the giant nest on top of the chimney here and you see one little stork sticking out but this is so special to to spaniards gabe i don't know if you experienced this while you were studying over there but it is when the storks come back and make the nest, that is like, that is so meaningful when you're a local. So this is something really special to, to see the first storks coming back and making the nest. Um, and you, you got to look up to find that. I mean, often in bell towers, often on churches, that's where they like to be. Now, continuing on, um, countryside always makes me think of food. And Gabe, I'm sorry, like your Spanish mama is sorry that you are a vegetarian <laughs> because although you can get probably get by on cheese and wine and a lot of good vegetables in Spain, um, some of their best known dishes include some sorts of meats. Um, my Some of my favorites. So first of all, morcilla. And morcilla can be made in multiple different ways and everyone has their, their own way of making it, but it's typically either made with rice or with onion. And then it can be fried, it can be kind of moussey, um, sort of like the Spanish version of haggis, and I can't get enough of it. I love it, and my preferred way is fried with uh, with onion. Um, the other thing that I always try to eat whenever I'm in Spain is cocido, and this is such a special meal, and particularly in the wintertime, but I mean, it's a little bit too hot to eat during the summer, but uh, in the winter, you will cook this broth on the fire for days, and then it all comes out, and it's actually deconstructed in front of you, so you see the garbanzo beans, the vegetables, you've got bread, you've got meat that all go into the stew, kind of like the one you were talking about um, when you were studying, but a little bit more goes into it, and then what you have to do, you, you're put to work in this. You have to reconstruct it to get it back into the bowl. So I think you can see in the next slide that this is what it kind of what kind of happens afterwards. You kind of put it back into your bowl and then you finally get to eat your soup. Uh, but this is a, a tradition across Spain, very hearty, again, especially in the countryside where you're going to be working in the fields all day. You need something warm. You need something hearty. This is going to keep it going all day long. But this is just one thing that Spain's known for. Another thing they're known for, of course, is paella. And uh, saw a little known fact, we don't often think about paella as being a thin layer, but really a traditional paella is just going to be like one or two kernels thick because you want to get this thing that's called socarat. And that is the little crispy burned, kind of like um, before you deglaze a pan in, in cooking, you put the wine in to deglaze all the stuff off of the bottom of the pan. You don't do that with paella because the person who is the most important person it, uh, at the meal is going to get the most socarat. So think about that the next time you're having paella, you want it to be as thin as possible. Um, and it does take a, a quite an effort to get through it. Other favorites, this is what you're going to find, uh, especially down along the Costa del Sol in the North Gabe. They're so known for their, their seafood. I was picturing all of the like caracoles and the barnacles when we were seeing Rick talk about octopus, but tuna salad, something so easy, just tuna, onion, tomato, olive oil. I could eat that every single day of my life. That would be like my final meal if I had the choice. And then bocarones, these are very important because I know anchovies in America get a really bad rap for being those cured, thick, smoky, salty things you get out of a can. Well, not in Spain. In Spain, bocarones can either be fried very light or they can just be marinated in olive oil and parsley and garlic. Um, but this is a staple everywhere you go, especially in the summer, something really light to eat. Keep an eye out for that on the menu. Let's see, what else do we have here? Oh, just more bocarones and adobo. Adobo are little fried um, fish. So the little cut up pieces of white fish that have been marinated in vinegar, uh, other spices, and then breaded and fried. And again, just makes a perfect light meal, especially down along the coast where we have a lot of the chiringuito um, bars. Of course, Meat and cheese, you can't go wrong with that. Always pairs well with red wine, um, the jamón, ibérico, and the, any kind of cheese. The cheese that I've been eating tonight is, um, this is my favorite cheese. I just get it at the Mercadona grocery store, and it is a sheep cheese. 
Um, and actually I've been nibbling on my little pieces. And when I get to the rind, I'm kind of missing my dog because normally when I eat this cheese, I toss him the rind and he gets a little treat too. So sorry, Blitz, you'll get some later. And last but not least, the calda. These are little broths that you get. And again, in the wintertime, totally typical. You go into a restaurant and often they will serve you a little calda, a little cup of um, basically broth with mint and sometimes even with sherry, Gabe. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen this. Two of my favorite things, of course, I'm a morning person, but these orange juice machines, I don't know why we don't have them in America. You pour in, you put in the whole oranges at the top of the machine and it kind of turns, a wheel turns, and then it squeezes the oranges for you, get the fresh orange juice. If you see that, if you see that machine anywhere in Spain, I tell you, go inside ask for a, ask for an orange juice and a cortado, the little coffee that will keep you going, get you ready for all your sightseeing or driving that you have to do that day. And I then last- see, I do remember seeing some of those, some of those machines and they yep. were always amazing. And then to bookend your day, of course, last but not least, the other culture in Spain is really the gin tonic and vermouth culture. And that, Glass is to scale. That is an enormous glass that they like to make their gin tonics out of. Um, very typical thing all over Spain and vermouth as well. And I've, I've had vermouth with orange and I've also had vermouth with olives. So you kind of can choose if you want to have like the salty version of vermouth or the sweet version of vermouth. But this is all making me really hungry and we have more ground to cover. <laughs> Well, Robin, thank you for that uh, tasty trip through Andalusia's hill towns. We have one more stop on our trip. Um, so after we wait a respectable amount of time after our gin and tonics and vermouths and we're good to drive again, we're going to hop in our car. We're going to go to Spain's southernmost tip and finish by venturing over into Morocco. Exactly. And first, we're going to make a little pit stop in Nerja, which is on the Costa del Sol. And this is really just to say that all of southern Spain has these beautiful sandy beaches, and there are some that are better than the others. And we really like to highlight Nerja as somewhere that's still um, a really nice mix of local, small town, not overly, um, not overly developed. And especially you can still get go to those chiringuitos and get those enormous paella pans fired all day or um, just fresh fish. Local, yeah, you can keep, keep going. Local hikes that you can do up to little towns called Forgiliana, um, this little aqueduct. So there's plenty to do here besides just kind of be, see and be seen. So that's kind of why we like Nerja a little bit better. And then I keep mentioning this word chiringuito. That's just a little beach bar, but those are just the fish that they've caught and they cook them on the open flame and you just tell them what you want. And then you sit down with the locals and for, you know, five or six euros, you have yourself a really good meal. And then we have the most famous thing at Nerja Beach, which is this paella. And Rick has a clip of Nerja we're going to see in a minute, but this guy has been making paella seven euros a plate you see the heaping amount that you get and he just is a legend in Nerja so again you you travel by your stomach this is a guy you definitely want to see and Rick will tell you even more about it my favorite Costa del Sol stop is the resort town of Nerja while capitalizing on the holiday culture, Nirha has retained some of its charm. The church fronts the square, which fronts the beach, and everybody's out strolling, eventually winding up on the proud Balcony of Europe Terrace. This bluff, jutting jauntily into the sea, overlooks miles of coastline. A castle occupied this spot for centuries. Nirha's castle was part of a 16th century lookout system. After Reconquista forces drove out the Muslim that's right. You don't come to the Coast of El Sol for history. You come for fun in the sun and relaxation. And relax is what countless expat residents do. Nerha's expats are mostly British. Like many along this coast, they actually try not to integrate. They enjoy their English TV and radio, and many barely learn a word of Spanish. Nerha has several well-equipped beaches. The one just below town retains its fishing village charm. Fishermen do their thing. 
while the tourists do theirs. The humble cottage evokes a bygone day. Spaniards love their little beach restaurants. A short hike takes us to a broader beach that appeals to different tastes. While it's packed through the summer, we're here in May when the heat and crowds are just right. Nestled snugly on the southernmost tip of Europe is the town of Tarifa. Passing through its medieval wall, we find the humble charms of a whitewashed town with hints of its Arabic past. Cafes and tapas bars complement the laid-back scene. The same wind that powers its windmills makes Tarifa a wind sport mecca. Just outside of town, a five-mile-long stretch of sand hosts young thrill-seekers from across Europe. Kite surfing is all the rage. Ideal conditions? The more wind, the better. Around here, instead of you flying a kite, these kites fly you. And the scene includes spectators. Here, far from the city squares and the ubiquitous cafes, these Europeans have found yet another way to embrace life. For me, Tarifa's top attraction, the fast boat to Morocco. Several boats a day make the intercontinental trip in about an hour. Tickets are easy. All you need is a few euros and your passport. The Strait of Gibraltar is where seas, continents, and cultures collide. Fishing, shipping, and movement of peoples. This narrow stretch of water has seen it all. And it's here that Islam and Christendom come together like cultural tectonic plates. Over the centuries, this narrow passage has witnessed lots of turmoil. Eighth century Muslim Moors sweeping north. Then in 1492, those same Moors retreating south, making this very same voyage. Today, wealthy Europe has invited back the people of North Africa to harvest its crops and do its low-end work. And today, as anywhere, with all this back and forth, there are both challenges and opportunities. All right, Robin. So um, we've come to the end of our road trip. We've hopped on the ferry. Um, we are going to have time for questions in just about three minutes. Um, but uh, we're going to take just a couple minutes to tease people with a couple glimpses of what they'll get across the water um, if they make the trip to Morocco. So yeah, ex exactly. And I mean, Rick has has done his Monday night travel on all of Morocco, but really this is Tangier and this is just the, the kind of gateway into Morocco. Uh, it's super easy to get there from Tarifa. And if you go to Tangier, you definitely want to go up to the Casbah. You want to stay in this tangled town area um with like little little teeny tiny alleyways and then almost every single guest house a lot of restaurants will have these rooftop terraces where you can overlook the the whole city and the beach and really gave i think my favorite thing to do is be up here during the call of prayer and just kind of like we started this program talking about santiago and kind of just the calm and serene of of being in in that town really in in tangier that's what this is about. You just soak it all in and have this totally different experience slowed down, just like we were experiencing in the hill towns of Spain and really um, giving yourself a chance to experience life in a totally different place. The other thing I would point out is uh, at the top of the market, you can go into the market. It's not quite as big as the, the market in Marrakesh or Casablanca. So that's a little bit nice because you can't get too lost but there's one special restaurant because we were talking about food i have to include this and it is the savoie de poisson and you can see it you don't there's no menu you just sit down and they just keep bringing you food and it is delicious and um, when you leave you get to take home your little wooden utensil with you um, which is really special too so it's there are just surprises all around every corner uh in tangier mm -hmm. and so many like little um, antique shops, Gabe, where I have got like very special um, souvenirs from the past, stuff you don't really need, but beautiful ceramics and, you know, just things that remind you of your time there that and and what was so unique about it. Well, Robin, I wish that we had another hour to continue on a road trip through Morocco, though, as you said, um, we do have 
um, a couple Monday night travel shows on Morocco. We did one with Lucas Peters. Um, and then Rick also did one last year on his trips to Morocco. So you can find those in the Monday night travel archives. I wanna make sure that we have time to get to some questions. Um, before we do that, we have just a very brief word from our sponsor. As I mentioned tonight, we wanted to focus on lesser traveled to destinations in Spain. Um, the vast, all but one of which are not on our tours, but the majority of the places we've discussed tonight are in our guidebooks. Um, and so if you are at a point that you want to travel independently and explore some of these places, you can pick up a guidebook. And Rob and I know that just last year, you did some of the research for these guidebooks. I did in Andalusia. And how was the guidebook research process for you? You know, there's just no, there's nothing better than being on the ground, talking to people face to face, get, I mean, getting lost, getting turned around, figuring out all the things that you have to learn. Um, I make the mistakes or we make the mistakes so the travelers have an easier time. And yeah, I don't think, I didn't realize certainly when I started out using our guidebooks, how unique it is, the amount of time that our researchers put on the ground in Europe. And as somebody who used the guidebooks long before I worked for this company, it makes me so happy to meet people like you that are doing that work and just I would innately trust you with my trip. Um, so, you know, Gabe, someone's got to try all the cheese and wine. That's all I can say. <laughs> well, we thank you for your sacrifices. Um, we're going to finish tonight, Robin, with some a few quick questions. And we've talked a lot about this being a road trip. Um, and I've never actually rented a car in Spain, I must confess. Um, but we do have Judith that is asking, what are some transportation options for getting to some of these smaller places? And if you do rent a car, is Spain a good place to do that? Do you need any international driver's license? Um, Spain is a great place to rent a car. Uh, it's always easier to have an international driver's license just in case anything happens. Um, you, Especially in the South, there are a lot of bus connections that will get you to those little towns. You just have to have a little bit more time and you have to be a little bit more on your own schedule. So you have to know you only get this amount of time in each city. Um, but it is possible. I, I, I say if you're going to go to the lengths of getting off the beaten track, rent a car. You you can definitely do it. It's not a difficult place to drive around. I, I'll also say that, um, especially where I was in the northwestern part of Spain, there aren't, you get a lot of high-speed rail lines connecting our best of Spain itinerary, but up in that corner, um, oftentimes the rail just isn't as good as an option. And there's the bus company that covers Spain. It's called Alsa, A-L-S-A. And I mostly took coach buses when I was going to some of these smaller towns. Um, we also have a question from, oh, where did it go? Um, oh, we have a question from somebody. This one is for me um, asking uh, somebody who's going to be going on our Andalusia tour and is a vegetarian and is wondering what to expect. I always say our tours do such a good job of accommodating different dietary restrictions. So you don't need to worry about your dietary restriction being accommodated. I do say as a vegetarian, I would say 75% of the time, I feel like I get a meal that I'm equally as excited about. 25% of the time, I get a large plate of sauteed vegetables, which are still tasty and still um, are enough for me. But I think if you do have a dietary restriction, you need to accept that sometimes you're going to be making a little bit of a sacrifice, um, but that you're still going to be taken care of. And for me, Robin, I lived off of Spanish tortilla. I yeah. just yeah. loved it. I was glad to live off of it. Frankly, I didn't really want to eat much else because I enjoyed it so much. Yeah. And I would just say, especially on that tour, um, to look for... Um, uh, what's the other, it's not gazpacho. It's the, uh, um, uh, oh crap. I can't think of the name of it. It's, it's, um, Almarin, Almaruzzo. it's like gazpacho, but it's, okay. it's everywhere. So look for gazpacho. Um, Robin, um, this, I'd be interested in, um, hearing your answer to this one. Gregory is wondering, um, 
is it necessary to be able to speak some Spanish in some of the small on some of these smaller towns? I think many of us are used to places with a large tourist infrastructure. We can find English speakers, but as we get further off the beaten path, is it important to do some Spanish learning? Yeah, and Ben, our faithful Ben, just gave me some Spanish learning. It's Salmareco that I was talking about, oh. not gazpacho. So it's the local kind of version of, of gazpacho. So look for Salmarejo on the Andalusia tour. I know you have a chance to get it at least one place. Um, yeah, especially as these um, hill towns, like as the younger generations grow up, they're tending to leave a little bit more. So the people who are more likely to speak English, unfortunately, are also ones who are leaving. Um, so just pleasantries, right? Like it's enough to just say, hola, and como esta, and um, por favor, and gracias, and that will get you enough. And I think what's different about having even the language barrier in a smaller town is that I find that the people in those smaller towns, they have more time, they have more patience, they are more interested in helping you because they're not like go, go, going to their next meeting or trying to catch a train or anything like that. So it's it's like kind of a trade-off that even if you don't speak as much Spanish in these little towns, the people there are almost more willing to help you. And I, I agree with what you say, Robin. At the end of the day, it it's a lot to ask of somebody to become fluent in a language just to travel there. Um, but there's a long way that you can, there's a lot, it goes a long way to just learn a few phrases, both logistically. I remember traveling in Italy once. I don't speak Italian, but I learned a lot of just kind of landmark vocabulary. And sure enough, I got lost on a run, but I knew how to say train station and ask where the train station was because I knew how to get from the train station to my to my hostel. Yeah. Um, but also just person personally it builds a lot of mutual respect to show that you respect their culture enough to at least learn a few basic phrases and a couple resources um, we have our spanish phrase book so you can just pull out a phrase book and find the phrase rather than memorizing it and i'm going to put ben on the spot and see if ben can put in the chat widget we do have a um, travel class that we've recorded that is beginning Spanish for travelers. Um, we actually have that for a few different languages on our website. So we'll see if Ben can get that in the chat widget for us. He's pretty awesome. I bet he can. <laughs> I bet he can too. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, one quick one. Um, Robin, do you know when the olive oil harvest typically is? Yeah, it's typically um, end of October, beginning of November. It kind of depends on the weather of that year. Um, so it's it's typically right around there. Excellent. Um, speaking of times of year, um, we had, let's see, who was it? That was, uh, Chris was asking if we saw the solar eclipse today. I hear it was kind of cloudy where you were in Seattle, Robin, but um, I got my eclipse glasses. It was 80% totality here. Um, and I got a great look at it. And we had somebody chiming in in the comments saying that apparently there is going to be a solar eclipse that's going along kind of that north, kind of the portions, at least that I talked about today, but going over Asturias, Castilla y León, and the Rioja in 2026. So if you want to plan ahead, go to some of the places we discussed tonight and catch a solar eclipse while you're at it. Um, it looks like it is going to be on August 12th, 2026. So start your planning now. That would be amazing. And especially I keep seeing, um, oh, in the peak of Sea Europa, they have um, a Parador there that I really want to stay at. So that could be a perfect place to, a perfect time to book the Parador in the peak of Sea Europa. Well, maybe we'll have to actually do this road trip, Robin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, the last question, Robin, that I have is kind of a vague one, but as we've been doing this presentation, I've been kind of thinking about um, the stages that we go through as a traveler. Rick always talks about the Maslow's hierarchy of travel needs. First, you need to learn your basic travel skills to get by. Then you kind of learn an appreciation of art and culture. 
then you start thinking about travel as, as a political act and per, perhaps a spiritual act if you're doing something like the Camino. Um, how do you, we've kind of talked about, you know, doing the best of for the first trip and then and maybe as you get to a second or third trip to Spain, investigating some of these places, how have your kind of priorities and values changed throughout your travels, especially in Spain? Um. Well, I mean, I think like my life has evolved around Spain. So um, I don't, I think it's particular, for me, it's particular to Spain why I feel this way. Um, I haven't got there in other places quite yet, but I think the more, like you said, the more comfortable you get with getting around and what are the customs and what are some of the hangups or the stumbling blocks and the hurdles and how can I get over them? Um, that you kind of get beyond like what's aesthetically pleasing and you get more into like, what do I like about life here? Um, and I have, I have just found that I really enjoy the Spanish people, the culture, the way of life there. Um, so it, it feels like home rather than feels like travel. And I don't know, I don't have like a, a manual of steps of, of telling other people how they can get there. I think it's just, finding the place where you first of all feel good whether whatever level you're at at the hierarchy of needs if you instantly go somewhere and feel a a attached to it or feel drawn to it you're probably going to go up that ladder a little bit faster than a place that you don't care so much about I think too for me I still I want to be clear every time I travel I do try to um engage with the history and the art and um, go to a few museums and cultural sites. And that's always something I want to be doing. But I do find that the more times I've visited a place, the more likely I am to check out sleepier towns or these kind of more workaday mid-sized cities that don't have as many or a high density of cultural sites but I don't think I could get to that point without having done some of the more culturally intensive places first to feel like I really understand the culture and values and history and art that underpin society there that all these Spaniards have grown up their whole lives learning about in school. Um, and so I do think that's interesting how I still think it's so valuable to go to those more blockbuster cities and see those blockbuster sites um, and then kind of gradually explore these more second and third cities. The only thing I can think of, of recommending is, is taking a do less approach, right? If you wanted to accelerate this ability to get to that point of, of feeling like part of the culture without taking the time to go to every big site is like, go to the smaller places and do less because I think sometimes in the big places you feel like I have to do this or I have to see this or I'm here, I have to go here. And in those smaller cities or, or when you have more time, you're not pressured to do something at every minute of the day. And so you you kind of like take that wall down and just kind of accept what's going on. So maybe that's a way of accelerating it. I love that. I always say, I always tell people, because I hear a lot of people saying they have to do things. And I always say, you don't have to do anything. Everything you're doing, you choose to do. So yeah. Thank you, Robin, for coming along on this journey. I could talk with you about Spain for another hour, but I know we've already, as many as all great road trips should, this road trip has gone a little longer than we had planned. Thank you to all of you that uh, stuck around. I hope that you found some places that you are interested in going to on your next Iberian adventure. Um, and we will see you next week when we are going beyond Europe altogether and we are going to explore Fiji with Manal. We look forward to seeing you all then. Good night, Robin. Good night, Gabe. Good night, Ben. Good night, Gabe. Good night, Robin. Good night, everybody. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you next week.